as U.S. President Barack Obama prepares to leave office, a look at the pivotal moments that defined his legacy in Africa. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry takes on Israel in a blunt final foreign policy speech and how a nerve protein discovery could help type 2 diabetics. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. The court in the Democratic Republic of Congo on Wednesday sentenced a political opposition leader to five years in prison. The judgment risks jeopardizing multi-party talks meant to organize a presidential election next year. Now, according to Georges Kampiamba, a lawyer and human rights advocate who attended the trial, the court found Frank Diongo, president of the opposition MLP party, guilty of illegally detaining three soldiers during violent protests last week in Kinshasa. The verdict comes as representatives of President Joseph Kabila's ruling coalition and the country's main opposition bloc say they are near in an accord which Kabila uh, could, would step down by the end of 2017. We're now to the Middle East, uh, where Russia and Turkey have brokered an agreement for a ceasefire in Syria. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin said on Thursday that Syrian opposition groups and the Syrian government have signed a number of documents, including a ceasefire deal that will take effect at midnight on the night of December 29th. Russia, which backs Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, and Turkey, which supports rebel groups, say they will guarantee the truce. As with previous halts in fighting, the deal applies to the Syrian military and rebel op the rebels opposing, but not to militant groups such as the Islamic State. Now, outgoing U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has unveiled his vision for a possible lasting solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In an hour-long speech Wednesday, Kerry warned that a two-state solution is in serious jeopardy and that one state is not in Israel's best interest. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu promptly condemned Kerry's speech, saying it was skewed in favor of the Palestinians. Viewers, as glad as Hoek has this, uh, the details. Kerry said those supporting the expansion of Israel's settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem are now defining the future of Israel. They believe in one state, Greater Israel. In fact, one prominent minister who heads a pro-settler party declared just after the U.S. election, and I quote, the era of the two-state solution is over. During his re-election campaign in 2015, Netanyahu vowed that no Palestinian state would be established under his watch. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has promised his staunch support for Israel once he takes office. Kerry argued that a greater Israel would never be at peace. There are a similar number of Jews and Palestinians living between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. They have a choice. They can choose to live together in one state or they can separate into two states. But here is a fundamental reality. If the choice is one state, Israel can either be Jewish or democratic. It cannot be both. Kerry said the United States has given more support to Israel than any other country and that both must remain true to their stated democratic values. We cannot properly defend and protect Israel if we allow a viable two-state solution to be destroyed before our own eyes. The Israeli Prime Minister promptly responded that Kerry's speech was biased. What he did was to spend most of his speech blaming Israel for the lack of peace by passionately condemning a policy of enabling Jews to live in their historic homeland and in their eternal capital, Jerusalem. The two-state solution envisions Jerusalem as the capital of both Israel and a future Palestinian state. A United Nations resolution condemns Israeli construction in East Jerusalem, which would be the Palestinian capital. Netanyahu said Israel will resolve outstanding differences with the Palestinians through direct negotiations. Zlatica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. U.S. President Barack Obama has three weeks left in his presidency. Africa 54's Paul Siska looks back at the legacy Mr. Obama leaves for Africa. 
So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. As president, Barack Obama made four trips to sub-Saharan Africa, visiting six countries, challenging its leadership on human rights issues, gay and women's rights, and on good governance. July 2009, in Ghana, he met with President John Atta Mills and famously told Parliament, Africa doesn't need strong men, it needs strong institutions. Development depends on good governance. Early in his second term, he went to Senegal, South Africa, and Tanzania, meeting with Senegal's President Macky Sall, South Africa's Jacob Zuma, and in Tanzania, President Jakaya Kikwete. When you've got good governance, when you have democracies that work, sound management of public funds, transparency and accountability to the citizens that put leaders in place, it turns out that that is not only good for the state uh, and the functioning of government, it's also good for economic development. Obama brought U.S. and African business leaders together. He unveiled the Power Africa initiative, aimed at bringing more reliable electricity to the continent, worked on trade agreements, discussed democratic development, and meeting global security challenges with his African partners. A high point for the president's family was their tour of Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for 27 years. The U.S. president returned to South Africa later in the year and attended the memorial for Madiba. Nelson Mandela died on December 5, 2013. He changed laws, but he also changed hearts. July 2015, President Obama made a long-anticipated visit to Kenya, his father's birthplace. He met with President Uhuru Kenyatta and spoke to young people at the Global Entrepreneurial Conference. He next addressed the African Union in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the first U.S. president to do so. And I'm convinced that nations cannot realize the full promise of independence until they fully protect the rights of their people. As time passes, the Young African Leadership Conferences, YALI, and Growing Network may prove to be his most significant contribution to U.S.-African relations or the Power Africa Initiative, electrifying more of what was once called the Dark Continent. The U.S. African Leaders Summit and public-private trade agreements reached in Washington and business relationships forged with partners on the continent. Or, under his watch, bipartisan renewal of the African Growth and Opportunities Act, reducing tariffs on U.S. and African imports. On democracy building, the Obama legacy is mixed, or perhaps it's just too early to judge. U.S. support helped bring about the first democratic transfer of power in Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation. Contrast that with South Sudan. Despite a hard-brokered comprehensive peace accord, many consider the world's youngest democratic nation a failed state. Several African leaders in power when Obama was first elected president remain, two U.S. terms later, entrenched with power well past their constitutionally mandated time continuing to thwart the democracy and institution building needed for their nation's prosperity and freedom. What Obama has done while in office is help shift the view of a purely troubled Africa to what it is, a continent of many nations, each vital to the security and prosperity of the United States and the world. Paul Sisko, VOA News, Washington. Well, even before President-elect Donald Trump is inaugurated on January 20th, the U.S. Senate will begin considering his nominees for top administration posts. VOA's Michael Bowman reports that Democrats are signaling grave misgivings over Trump's cabinet picks, but would be unable to block them without help from across the aisle. I think it's going to be one of the great cabinets ever. Ever, ever. In choosing his presidential inner circle, Donald Trump drew from corporate boardrooms, the military, and the ranks of conservative pro-business public servants. I'm a businessman. Perhaps no Trump nominee has gotten more attention than petroleum executive Rex Tillerson, tapped to be secretary of state. My relationship with, Vlad with uh, Vladimir Putin, which dates back almost 15 years now, he understands that I'm a businessman. And I've invested a lot of money, our company has invested a lot of money 
in Russia. We're going to ask a lot of questions, and we'll see what sorts of answers Mr. Tillerson has. Democrat Chris Kuhn serves on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that will consider Tillerson's nomination. There are both Republicans and Democrats asking questions about Mr. Tillerson's potential conflicts of interest, about his long and close relationship with Vladimir Putin in Russia, uh, and about his ability to balance the demands of being a diplomat and fighting for America's interests with his long experience leading an oil and gas company. The confirmation hearings, at least some of them, will be very contentious. This is going to be, in some ways, uh, Trump's first test of congressional relations. Most Senate Republicans are rallying around Trump's picks. Well, I've been very impressed with the uh, nomination so far of the nominees that we're already aware of. Uh, I think uh, I'm optimistic that they'll all be confirmed. Republicans have a slight Senate majority, and if they remain unified, they can assure Trump's cabinet selections are confirmed. These senators also realize they're going to have to work with this president over the coming years, and one of the easiest ways to sully the relationship between you and the president of your party is to really uh, run his nominees through the ringer. Democrats, meanwhile, will use confirmation hearings to illuminate and probe questions surrounding the nominees, hoping to sway public opinion and a few Republicans. The Constitution tasks senators with providing advice and consent on nominees, a duty Democrats say they take seriously. Uh, one of the signature features of American democracy uh, is the separation of powers between the executive branch and the legislative branch. There is not much that Democrats in the Senate can do without having two or three Republicans join with them. For now, Trump is talking up his nominees, describing Tillerson as, quote, a fierce advocate for America's interests around the world. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. Well, officials in the Philippines say at least 50, 32 people were wounded Wednesday when two bombs exploded during an amateur boxing match in the central province of Leyte. Now, the scene around the outdoor boxing ring was blocked off Thursday while debris, shoes and chairs littered the ground. Provincial police say 16 of the wounded were taken to hospitals for treatment and the remaining victims were treated and released. At least 10 of the victims were children between 7 and 15 years old. Uh, police are trying to identify the attackers. No one has claimed responsibility. Communist guerrillas have established a presence in Leyte province, located about 610 kilometers southeast of Manila. But there were no immediate signs they, they or any other militant groups were involved. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up, a South African resort that lets you swim with crocodiles. And why? It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Stay with us. Here's what's new. What's new? A giant man robot has apparently escaped the movie Avatar. Okay, that's not true, but a robot that looks eerily similar has taken its first baby steps as it towers over its human colleagues at the Hanguk Mire Technology Company just outside of Seoul. The four meter tall, one and a half ton metal beast called Method 2 is so big it needs its own pilot in the robot's torso to control the robot's limbs. Hanguk Mire Technology Chairman Yan Jin Ho says Method 2 is the world's first manned bipedal robot. Our robot is planned to be used for entertainment purposes, such as movies or theme parks, and in places where a lot of power, but also delicate procedures are needed, such as in industries or construction. Jin Ho says the robot will be ready for sale by the end of 2017 at around $8 million. VOA's What's New. I'm Todd Grosson. I'm Milar Sega. I'm the host of VOA's The Correspondence, a roundup of the world's top stories with analysis from our dedicated reporters. It's really a conversation the same way that you would bring a friend to your home and ask them what's going on. In our correspondence, we'll do that and answer those questions through their own eyes. That appears a false choice in more ways than one. We can't actually put you there, but we can come pretty close. In 30 minutes, we'll show you the world.
Welcome back. Now, here's what's in health news. Researchers have developed uh, therapies that use the body's immune system to fight cancer. Now, a team of the Johns Hopkins University's Department of Biology has discovered that a protein which helps neurons grow also triggers the release of insulin in the pancreas and may one day lead to early intervention in cases of type 2 diabetes. Faith, uh, viewers, Faith Lapidus reports. Nerve growth factor, or NGF, has a second job in the body. Reggie Curavella's team found receptors for the protein in pancreatic beta cells. They produce insulin, vital for the body to metabolize glucose. It's been known for a while that glucose can kind of remodel the skeletal barrier to secrete insulin, but the downstream pathways, how glucose is sensed by the beta cells to remodel the skeletal barrier was not known. And what we found is that the NGF receptor is involved, is the link between glucose and remodeling of the cytoskeletal barrier to secrete insulin. High blood glucose levels cause NGF to be released from the pancreatic blood vessels, which prompts the beta cells to relax the cell wall barrier and release insulin. Curavella's team tested the glucose levels in mice after genetically manipulating the function of the NGF receptor. So what we did was to remove the NGF receptor specifically from the pancreatic beta cells and we found that uh, these beta cells uh, were no longer able, they could make insulin but when confronted with high glucose were not able to secrete uh, insulin in adequate amounts. They found the same deficiency in human beta cells, but do not yet know how the system is affected in diabetics. By the time a patient is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they have already lost 80% of beta cell function. So I think it's absolutely critical to uh, figure out the pathways that are important for beta cell function so that we can manipulate these pathways for early intervention of the disease as opposed to managing a chronic disease after. Curavella hopes that further studies could lead to drugs that affect receptor activity and treat pre-diabetics. Faith Lapidus, VOA News. Rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, is an autoimmune disease in which the body attacks its own joints, leading to crippling pain, swelling, and a lack of mobility. Uh, the disease has disabled millions of people worldwide, uh, but diagnosing patients early could allow doctors to slow or stop the progression of the disease. VOA's Kevin Enox has our report. Sue Arnott has rheumatoid arthritis. Her first symptoms started showing up when she was only 22. It was just one night. I went to bed perfectly all right, woke up in the night crying because it hurt so much in my wrists. Since then, Arnott has had four knee replacements, numerous operations on her wrist and feet, and she is waiting for her second hip replacement. But tissue samples like these, taken from a woman who is suffering early symptoms of RA, may allow researchers to short-circuit the disease before it takes its toll on patients. You're looking at this, the tissue, the histology, the microbiology, the x-ray imaging, and putting it together as a pathotype, that means a collection of these features, like you would do in breast cancer. You'd have both the tissue diagnosis, the imaging, and then the treatment would be tailored to the type of cancer you have. We have to do the same thing here. Haley Rose is part of a new generation of RA patients. She was diagnosed at the age of 24. Her mother also had the disease, but thanks to early intervention, she's fighting back with aggressive treatment. I know that I, I'm on the radar now, so the minute I get any swelling, the minute I get any, any um, worsening of my symptoms, I can come and, and get treated. And the problem with my mum is that she wasn't treated early enough and aggressively enough, so that's when it was in the early days that a lot of the joint damage happened. Those watching the early intervention research say prevention could be the best way to stop RA's devastating effects. It's a disease which has proved impossible to cure after many, many decades of research. I think curing patients with established rheumatoid is a uh, goal that many researchers um, are striving towards, but it's proved an elusive goal so far. Trying to prevent people from getting rheumatoid in the first place is another strategy for tackling this chronic condition and I think represents a really exciting avenue of research. Kevin Enix, VOA News, Washington.
Now, what better way to learn about animals than to observe them in their natural habitats? That is one reason people go scuba diving, traveling safaris, or simply pick up a pair of binoculars and do some bird watching. But some animals are better observed from a steel cage. Viewers, Judd Cootage reports. Sharks are among the world's fiercest predators. For those who want the excitement of being up close with their teeth, some tourist resorts offer diving in cages. It is a safe experience, except when the shark, excited by bait thrown around the cage, unexpectedly breaks into it, as happened recently at the California resort. The tourist diver who was in the cage really got his money's worth. When he go into the cage, uh, he was swimming beside me. A much easier and safer way to observe sharks is in large aquariums, where they endlessly circle around. While sharks are constantly in motion, another dangerous predator spends much of its time basking on the riverbanks. Seeing Nile crocodiles in their natural habitat from a distance is something special, but for some people, not good enough. It's very cool. To see the crocodiles was on top of my list of to-do things. The people are great and it's safe. What a great experience to see the crocodiles from very close and with the jaws open. They made sure the crocodiles came close to us. I invite everyone. The experience is offered by a resort in Cape Town, South Africa. Protected by steel bars and a thick layer of perspex, tourists can spend a few minutes observing animals underwater. Although prodding crocodiles with a stick is considered unethical, sometimes it is necessary to show how fast they can be when attacking. Animal activists from the International Union for Conservation of Nature say there is educational benefit from observing crocodiles up close. How many people will have the opportunity to see a crocodile from, for example, from the bottom up and actually see this animal swimming, how it uses its tail, how it uses its legs and its web back feet to steer. Nile crocodiles are in good shape, but many other crocodile species are vulnerable or critically endangered, especially in parts of Asia, where they are hunted for food and skins, while their habitat is constantly shrinking. George Putic, VOA News, Washington. I'll keep watching them from a distance. Well, it's time now for a short break. When we come back, New Year's resolutions. We hit the streets of Washington to find out who will make them and who will break them. We'll be right back. Anta buratai, kai buratai, kasa menene ke galera kai. Kasa ni, kuma Allah ya pini.
Well, as the end of the year nears, people from all walks of life make promises to do something different and even better in the new year. Now, here's, here's Africa 54's Esther Gidu Ewart with a scoop on New Year's resolutions. It is a common tradition towards the end of the year to hear people talking about their New Year resolutions, and I caught up with some on the Capitol Hill lawn and others in their Washington, D.C. offices. Christian Gazar, a tourist from Texas, says he is ready to be a first-time dad. We were trying to, you know, uh, spend more time with the family. We have a baby coming, so, you know, fixing the room and, you know, getting all those decorations up and going and um, spending more time with my parents. For Fatma Alimasi, who works in Washington, D.C., her thoughts are consumed by the political chaos in her native country of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -mm. For this year and with everything going on in my country back home, I'll be, I'm trying to talk to people about peace. No more fighting. We, we need peace in Congo. We need peace in Africa. We need peace everywhere around the world. That's my New Year resolution. Back at the Christmas tree on the lawn in front of the U.S. Congress, nine-year-old Zeke gives me a high five. He's excited about being on television. It is to make better grades in school and eat healthier. Zeke's older sister, Kasina, is a girl on a peace and unity mission. I am a big advocate for gender and racial equality, and so I think that, like, I mean, we're all part of the human race, so we should all just, like, love each other and promote equality. And so, yeah, I think it would be really cool, like, in the future to travel the world and, like, help little kids, like, encourage them to pursue educations and, like, stuff like that. Sion Girma is ready to make some changes in the new year. Uh, I have planned to lose some weight. Frederick Nkudikije hails from Burundi. To work harder than before and achieve all my uh, objectives. And, uh, you know, professionally and also family-wise. College students Kiera and Andrea are braving the seasonal cold weather in Washington. Yes, I do have a New Year's resolution. It's to eat better and get in the gym. <laughs> it's hopefully to be happy in 2017 and to get a job. And just in case you don't have a New Year resolution yet, no problem. Because every day offers a new beginning to make whatever changes you need in your life. Esther Gidu Ewart, VOA News, Washington. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. I'm Lino Mudu from Africa 54. This is VOA. Follow us on Africa 54. Go to facebook.com slash VOA Africa 54. Welcome to English in a Minute. A plate is a dish that you put your food on. Have a lot on your plate. Hey, Anna, I'm having a party this weekend. You should come. I wish I could, but my weekend is really busy. I'm baking a wedding cake, writing my article, teaching two classes, and oh, my parents are visiting. Wow, you have a lot on your plate. I do. To have a lot on your plate means that you are dealing with many responsibilities or problems at one time. Imagine a plate being so full that it cannot fit any more food on it. Someone who has a lot on their plate is very busy, maybe too busy. And that's English in a Minute.